Good evening, everyone. My name is Fred Lee, and I'm the Director of Alumni Engagement at uh, Alumni UBC. Welcome to Mastermind Master Class with Hubert Lacroix, taking place tonight at UBC Robson Square on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded indigenous territory of the Squamish, Musqueam, and tsleil Nation. Please, come on in. Don't be shy. Welcome. Uh, it, is in, it, it is indeed my pleasure to welcome everyone to tonight's event. Mastermind Masterclass is a new Alumni UBC speaker series offering alumni an unprecedented look into the minds of modern thinkers, making a unique impact on the world and the lessons they've learned. Tonight, uh, it is our fourth installment, and we do want to sincerely acknowledge the estate of Kitty Heller for their generous contribution to making this series possible. It is wonderful to see so many of you carve out the time from your very busy schedules to join us this evening. It has also been a very busy year at UBC. Uh, we have concluded our very successful Start an Evolution campaign, engaging more than 130,000 individual alumni throughout the historic campaign. As well, as you may have heard, we have raised $1.6 billion for research, student learning, and community initiatives. We officially opened the Robert H. Lee Alumni Center, and we launched UBC Centennial. UBC is proud to mark its 100th anniversary as a global leader in education, 100 years since welcoming its very first class of 379 students in September of 1915. To learn a little more, I now invite you uh, to direct your attention to the screen. There are few earthly things more beautiful and splendid than a university. There are few universities that can claim to have grown to the stature of UBC in such a short span of time. It is the unique privilege of the University of British Columbia to be located where one of the world's most important traditions began and flowered. At this significant milestone, we should acknowledge and praise those who founded the university. You accepted traditions and became part of traditions. Every last citizen is in fact a part owner. And this is without doubt what the founders had in mind when they chose for the university motto, QM S, it is yours. There's a place where those who hate ignorance may strive to know, where those who perceive truth may strive to make others see. That we may indeed be the people's university, that is the spirit on which this university was founded and it still lives and survives on this great campus today. UBC Centennial has been a year-long program of initiatives marking 100 years of learning, research, innovation, and community engagement. Over the past century, UBC is proud to have graduated more than 307,000 students, graduates from our Point Grey and Okanagan campuses, who are making positive change in British Columbia, Canada, and around the world. 
We look forward to welcoming 10,000 more students to the alumni family as graduation will take place on the Point Grey campus starting bright and early tomorrow morning and in Kelowna early June. This Saturday, May 28th, we invite everyone here to join us at the Vancouver campus as we close out UP, UBC's centennial year. You'll hear from some great minds providing perspectives on topics of the future, and the day will culminate in a talk from iconic Canadian actor William Shatner as the Trekkie talks about the importance of living a life driven by curiosity. I invite everyone um, to uh, check out all the details at alumni.ubc.ca or ubc100.ca. Now usually this is the time where we would encourage most people to turn off your cell phones, but that is just not the case uh, tonight. We would love to hear from you, so feel free to tweet. The event is at alumniubc and the hashtag is UBCMMC. Once again, it's at UBC, and the hashtag is UBCMMC. Also this evening, we're once again going to be using our very cool audience engagement platform to engage everyone in the conversation. If you have a mobile device, that be a smartphone, a tablet, a laptop, please take 30 seconds right now to um, take out your device and go to alumniubc.cnf.io. Again, it's alumniubc.cnf.io. And the URL should be projected on the screen. So this audience engagement platform will allow you to question, comment in real time throughout the presentation. Other attendees can like your question and following Mr. Lacroix's presentation, our moderator Valerie Castleton will endeavor to pose the top questions from this audience to our special guests. So again, the URL is alumniubc.cnf.io. And we will be sharing the URL throughout the conversation tonight. So for a trial run, you will have noted we have populated a polling question. Are you a UBC alumnus? If you could take the time to answer that now, the re results should be projected on the screen as each of you vote. As you can see roughly right now about 72 percent of the audience are UBC alumni. Again this is a, a technology that uh, we have been using for the past few years and TED Talks just recently adopted so we really feel like we've been ahead of the curve on this. Uh, following the presentation, our moderator Valerie Castleton will sit down with Hubert and lead a Q&A and then we invite everyone to a complimentary reception where we can continue the conversation. Tonight's conversation will be podcasted as well. It will be available as a webcast courtesy of our good friends from the Irving K. Barber Learning Center. So now it is my pleasure to introduce this evening's moderator, who will be introducing our very special guest. Valerie Castleton is a UBC graduate and has always kept close ties to UBC, having served on the Alumni UBC Board of Directors since 2013, and prior to that was a member of the Alumni Association Advisory Council. She also serves currently on the Alumni Achievement Awards a selection Committee and the Trek Advisory Committee and has been a UBC mentor and a tri-mentor for more than 10 years. A UBC graduate with a BA Honours in English, Valerie also holds a bachelor's degree in journalism from Carleton University. Valerie is the managing editor of the Vancouver Sun and the province newspapers, publishing with a combined newsroom of more than 140 journalists and staff. She is responsible for news gathering, projects, and strategic initiatives that promote audience engagement over all publication platforms. 
as two of the largest uh, publications in Post Media's national network and operating the largest newsroom in Western Canada, the Vancouver Sun and Province together reach more than 1.4 million readers every week and all platforms. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in giving a warm round of applause to your moderator, Valerie Castleton. Thank you, Fred. All broadcasters are adapting to revolutionary changes in their business, from the, cont the content that they provide to the way that Canadians use or consume their news services. But how is it that you transform your organization when you are an iconic public institution, one as revered but also as maligned as Canada's public broadcaster? To answer this question, it is my pleasure to introduce to you tonight Hubert T. Lacroix. Hubert was appointed President and, CBC, uh, and uh, CEO of CBC Radio Canada on November the 5th, 2007 for a five-year term and then was reappointed again and his term runs until December 31st, 2017. As President and CEO, Monsieur Lacroix is responsible for overseeing the management of CBC Radio Canada in order to ensure that Canada's national public broadcaster can deliver on the various aspects of its mandate and continue to offer Canadians a broad spectrum of high quality programming that informs, enlightens, and entertains, and that is created by, for, and about Canadians. Previously, Monsieur Lacroix was a special counsel in the law firm Steichman Elliott. He was executive chairman of Telemedia Corporation and was a senior partner at McCarthy Tetro for nearly 20 years. Please welcome tonight Hubert Lacroix. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining me. Many thanks to UBC for the invite. You know, I must confess that it's a little intimidating to be speaking at an event which is called Mastermind Masterclass because I don't feel the master of much right now. But I do feel very, very fortunate to be leading an institution that touches the lives of Canadians like CBC does, and often, most often, in ways that are deep, very personal, and very long-lasting. My first adult connection to CBC Radio Canada goes back 32 years, in 1984, when I was hired by Radio Canada to cover basketball at the Olympic Games in Los Angeles. They gave me a blue jacket, this awful blue jacket, with our logo extremely evident on the breast pocket. This jacket still hangs in my closet as evidenced by this picture taken a couple of days ago. And when I look at it, it brings back memories, great memories of the pride that I felt of being part of that broadcasting team and of showing off my Radio Canada credentials when I entered and exited Olympic venues. I feel the same pride today as I lead our organization through a time when the way that we cover events, share information and promote culture is undergoing a radical transformation. Well, there's a revolution going on in rec rooms, offices, and classrooms around the world. A revolution in which 15 million people are taking part. They're sharing scientific data, arguing philosophy, or passing on cooking tips and gossip, night and day through a computer network called Internet. Yes, that was Peter. We've never seen anything like it. We are now in an age of worldwide constant connectivity through our digital devices. You know, with a barely a swipe of your phone, you can instantly be better informed about your world than at any other time in human history. 
and we're just beginning to understand this Internet of Things and how that connectivity will transform our lives. So obviously, this, all of this, is changing everything. Certainly changing our broadcasting industry. And it's changing the way the public broadcaster is serving Canadians. This evening, I'd like to talk about what CBC Radio Canada is doing to become more connected to you and more relevant to you. And I'd like to also share some of the things that we've learned, some of the challenges, some of the successes of transforming a very large organization, a very large public institution like ours. You don't have to work at CBC Radio Canada to know that the past few years have been a period of incredible change and it hasn't been easy. Some have questioned whether public broadcasting can survive in the internet area or in fact whether it should. I believe it has to and here's why. In this always on global digital space what Canadians need more than ever is a Canadian public space. A space that serves the public interest, that informs Canadians about the, their country. A space that encourages them to connect with each other, that elevates our Canadian stories and our values. A space that builds social cohesion. This is what public broadcasting is, un is uniquely qualified to do. Our plan towards 2020 is built around this concept. But in order to strengthen this connection with you, we've had to change how we connect with each of you. And change has been faster than anybody ever expected. 70% of Canadians already have a smartphone. In less than 10 years, these devices have penetrated every aspect of our lives. More than a billion people are now active users of Facebook. 400 million people use Instagram each month. And 100 million people use Snapchat every day. 100 million people use Snapchat every day. That's no surprise to you, I'm sure. Because that's how most of you in this room are already getting your news and your information from your customized feeds on Apple, Facebook, Twitter, Twitter, read it, just to name a few. Increasingly, it's also where you go for entertainment. If we were starting over, the smart money would be investing everything into digital. But we didn't start from a blank page. We are an institution rooted in this country's history, 80 years of it, with powerful legacy assets and a feeling of fierce pride, pride and ownership by you. That connection is one of our greatest strengths and it is a great privilege. But it also means that each change, each program, each service can be very, very difficult to transform and to manage because everyone, and that includes my mother, has an opinion about our transformation and what it should look like. Public institutions like ours are expected to be at the forefront of change. We have to see it coming and we have to lead it. We have to be connected in rele and relevant to a digital generation. But at the same time, at CBC Radio Canada, we have to ensure that we do not leave other Canadians behind. Canadians are still watching more than 27 hours of live television each week, most of it in prime time. They also love our traditional radio services, just on the CBC side. Our morning programs are number one, two, and three in 25 of the 26 markets that we serve. And they are number one in 15 of those markets. So we need to nurture these connections, these audiences, 
as we move on to digital. All of that in an environment of limited financial resources where advertising revenues, which for us represent anywhere from 20 to 30% of our top line, is moving more and more away from television. It's been two years since we launched our 2020 plan, our plan to retool the public broadcaster to become more local, to double our digital reach, and to be more relevant to Canadians. Two years ago, a lot of it seemed like too much change. Frankly, it didn't help that as we were launching our plan, our government appropriation was reduced by $115 million. On top of the advertising revenues and their pressures that were facing all of broadcasting companies, and in addition to other government or regulatory related cuts. We had to scale back. We lost a lot of talented people. The initial public response wasn't much better. Many feared that we were dressing up cost cutting. They simply did not believe that the 2020 plan was a bona fide, a real strategic shift. That was our starting point. I have to admit, it wasn't pretty. It was a very difficult time, maybe even a discouraging time. Where are we today now? Well, we have all been witnessing our transformation, and it is absolutely incredible to see. Today, we are Canada's biggest online media destination for news and information. Every month, more than 15 million people, 15 million Canadians, use our digital sites. And that number has increased by 3 million in the past year alone. And more than half of those people are reaching us through their smartphones. You are engaging with us and with each other. You're posting comments. You're sharing your content on Twitter and on Facebook. You're holding digital conversations from one end of the country to the other. This is exactly what our strategy was all about and what CBC Radio Canada's role is today. We want to be the public space for Canadian conversations. On CBC News, our first priority now is to deliver content through mobile devices. Then we go to the web. Then we go to radio. Then we go to television. We have completely inversed our model. Yes, it's the right thing to do, but this has meant shifting resources. Cities that once got 90 minutes of television news at dinner time, now will get either 60 or 30 minutes. But we're now reaching people on mobile 18 hours a day, seven days per week. That mobility is really convenient for us, but it was vital for residents fleeing Fort McMurray. As the fire was advancing, we made sure that crucial information was getting to those who needed it wherever they were. And when the media was escorted into Fort McMurray for the first look at the damage, CBC News live-streamed video from the moving bus in real time to the thousands of people desperate to know what had happened to their homes and their neighborhood. We put it on our news network, on our website, on Facebook, on our news app, on Apple TV, on Android TV, and on YouTube. That's how we must serve Canadians today. Sure, we invest and we continue to invest in traditional radio, but at the same time, we really believe in podcasting. This spring, CBC developed a new podcast series. It was called Someone Knows Something, a true crime investigation into the disappearance of a five-year-old Ontario boy in 1972. It became the top downloaded podcast on iTunes in Canada the very first day that it was available. And within weeks, it became one of the top podcasts downloaded in the US, only recently bumped out of the top 10 by something called Game of Thrones. So, what have we learned? 
Well, transformation is relentless. And folks, it has no finish line. To make it work, every decision, every conversation has to have this direction, has a filter and a focus every day. But change and constant movement can undermine your employee's sense of stability. Some embrace change, but some fear it. Too much disruption can paralyze an organization. So you have to be ready to change and you have to prepare for that change. As of today, more than 1,260 of our employees have retrained for new digital skills. Another 630, 630, have trained for new business skills to support this new direction at all of our levels. We are also hiring the next generation of digital creators. We've filled 150 of these new positions and we are looking to hire 300 more in the coming years again to support our plan and our digital shift. We've also learned that momentum is key. You know, people, they don't expect you to hit home runs every day, but they need to see that you are scoring runs. I mean, this is baseball season. They need to see the ball in play. They need to score runs. You need to see your runners on base because when people don't see what they're gaining, they will tend to focus only on what they're losing. They need to see that our transformation is allowing us to do things we simply could not do before. Let me tell you about one example that I'm particularly fond of. The Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women Project created in Winnipeg by our Aboriginal Digital Unit together with our investigation team. Over six months, these CBCers met with each woman's families and friends. They looked at every single case. They created an interactive site to really tell each of those stories. The first site of its kind. It's really incredibly powerful. And it's producing results. It got Canadians talking about what was happening in our own backyard. And because of their work, the RCMP reopened two closed cases and was able to successfully close another one. This is the power of public broadcasting in the digital age. This is our transformation in action. I truly believe that this time can be a tipping point, a golden moment for public broadcasting in Canada and for Canadians but only if we can seize this opportunity. Unfortunately, at a time when Canadian culture is facing global challenges, some believe the solution is to make the public broadcaster smaller. That if CBC was somehow prevented from having local websites or a digital first strategy, that newspapers would be more profitable. Some private broadcasters I've even suggested that the solution to their declining revenue is to limit what CBC can do for Canadians, to fence us into some kind of status quo, or to transform us into gap, into gap fillers. This view is as short-sighted as it is mistaken. There's no such thing as status quo. It doesn't exist anymore. If there's one thing I've learned, and we've all learned at CBC Radio-Canada, it's just how fast things are changing. All of us must change. Let me be clear about this point. Undermining public broadcasting will not help private companies make more money. It won't help Canadians find out more about what's happening in their communities. It's not going to improve Canadian storytelling, and it's surely not going to create more great Canadian programs. CBC Radio-Canada is not the problem, but we're definitely part of the solution. Global media conglomerates have little interest in a public space for Canadians. That's not their mission, that's not their business model, and that's okay. A strong public broadcaster exists to ensure that public space, 
that Canadian space. It strengthens Canadian identity and it raises the bar for all Canadian media organizations to do more for Canadians. I think that the government understands this. You've surely heard that for the first time in a decade, government is reinvesting in public broadcasting, starting with $70 million, $75 million in this first year. That support gives us some breathing room after years of cuts. It will ensure that we will continue our transformation. We want Canadians to be amazed with what a reinvestment in public broadcasting can do. And folks, it's more than the money. It's what this reinvestment represents. It's a vote of confidence in the value of our programs and in our vision for the future. And when government says that culture is important, something else happens. All of a sudden, people start to think about what is possible again. I notice it when I speak to my colleagues at Telefin, the National Film Board, the other museums. We are very optimistic about the future. We have new ideas for partnerships and projects to support Canadian culture, Canadian music, Canadian artists, Canadian filmmakers, Canadian producers. The list goes on. This is a very exciting time. Yes, there will continue to be challenges. The decline in advertising undermines the ability of all broadcasters to create good Canadian programs. A modern broadcasting business model needs to reflect modern business realities in our ecosystem. The current one is still broken. I think that the government's consultation on the future of Canadian content in a digital world is a very important step in addressing this challenge and we at CBC Radio Canada look forward to providing whatever support we can. We have learned a lot about transformation over the past few years and we will continue to learn, to innovate and to adapt. And we'll do this by engaging with Canadians. And I'm going to finish with one story, one more example from right here in Vancouver. Last January, 300 high school students spent a Saturday in our broadcast center, the Vancouver Broadcast Center, for our second annual Junior J School, a hands-on program that we created and was created by our top journalists and producers. We talked with these students about reporting on the front lines, about the changing nature of journalism. Like you here at UBC, their ideas, their optimism is going to define this country. You are already shaping social media. You have a role now in shaping your Canadian public space as well. And that's why we're building this public space. It's for you and it's for all Canadians. Thank you. Do you want this? I will do this. I can bring water. I can open and close lights. I think we're good here. Thank you. It's good. Thank you, Hubert. Are we good for sound? Can everybody hear? Yeah? Thank you. Great presentation. I, I, it's interesting. We were talking a little bit about this before we came in here, but a lot of the transformation and the legacy issues that Hubert was talking about this evening, uh, you could have the same conversation talking also about private media about newspapers, about radio, about television. It is a much larger question than just uh, a question for CBC, yes? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, we've got the great tablet here with all of your questions, so please uh, take, uh, take Fred up on his offer and uh, <coughs> log on to the site, and uh, we'll go through and I'll ask the questions. It would appear that we don't really need moderators, we just need tablets <laughs> to tell us what the very best questions are. So, We'll start, and then also, uh, if some of you haven't brought your handheld device, there are uh, folks who have uh, mics. Uh, mics on either side at the back. So just put up your hand, and they'll come down, they'll give you the mic, and we'll move back and forth between the trusty tablet and 
the old-fashioned microphone, okay? So, Hubert, uh, our, our biggest question here tonight, what percentage of the new jobs that the CBC is creating are full-time and stable, and how many rely on short-term contracts and precarious freelance labor? <laughs> I'm not answering that. He's answering <laughs> that. All of the jobs that we are trying to create are full-time positions. They're full-time positions in the context of our, of our um, transformation. We need these skills. Um, and we need them at different places in the corporation, whether it's on the Radio Canada side or on the CBC side. It's all about these digital skills that we need to support the transformation. Yeah, it's interesting because you've been taken to task for decreasing oh, uh, yes. the size of your staffing, and yet you were talking about 150 and 300 hires all in the digital area because these are, these are the people who are going to help us with the transformation. And the jobs, and yes, we have uh, gone through tough times with cuts. When I came in in Jan 1, 2008, we were close to 12,000 people. 11,800 when you included the contractuals and the temps. Mm -hmm. And we're now at 7,500 including the temps and the contractual. So that's about 3,500, 4,000 jobs mm -hmm. that, we had to take, that we had to take out. But you see, this reinvestment is not about bringing back the employees. The choices of which um, involved legacy um, services, perhaps, that we uh, chose in this environment of difficult financial uh, times to um, no longer pursue. Yes? There are some overcuts, and we, we've, we understand that, and we are going to be reinvesting in different places in the country. But this is really about the shift that we're involved in and about getting the right skills in the right places. Mm -hmm. And the, the backdrop, really, is that other media have also been uh, retrenching to Absolutely. some degree at the same time, right? I mean, we've seen cuts greater than that. And, I mean, there have been media outlets that have closed down altogether or newspapers that have gone uh, digital and are no longer publishing in paper, right? So, so it's all about, it's, it's about the ecosystem. And when we talk about this media industry in which we're involved, and the papers are facing it, the conventional broadcasters are facing it, the specialty channels are facing it, I mean, the competition is not ourselves. It's not about CTV and Bell and, and Global and, and TELUS. It's about mm -hmm. Netflix, it's about Google, it's about Amazon, it's about their, it's about HBO, it's about their capacity to create programs that will catch your interest. And that's how we see the world right now. And compete with Game of Thrones. Yes. <laughs> I have to admit, what was I doing last night? <laughs> how, how do you balance your goals and obligations as a public broadcaster with your economic constraints and which takes priority? The mandate, the famous three verbs, in our Broadcasting Act, we are there to inform, enlighten, and entertain. People think this is taken lightly at CBC Radio but it's not. I mean, I have senior people in, front, in the front row. We all wake up in the morning because we believe in these three verbs. We also believe in culture, and we believe in democracy. And this is also a conversation we had, yeah. Valerie and I. Yeah. Um, when we say that we think that we have a role in democracy, in making sure that we don't taint you with a view, but that we, have, we give you a diversity of voices so that you can actually form your own opinion on subject matters, so that when you come to a point where you have to vote, whether it's in a regional election, or a municipal election, a provincial election, a school board election, a um, federal election, that you are a better informed citizen, and by, by doing this, we ensure democracy in this country. And this is something that we strongly believe in at CBC Radio Canada, and this, this is the reason why we show up at work. So, yes, the mandate of CBC Radio Canada drives us every day, and when we have to make cuts, and when we have to try to balance, I mean, the, the, the overall uh, resources that we had, our financial resources, went down from, for, for, uh, at about 400 million some dollars, let's say between four and 450 million bucks over the last five years. So when you look at this, and you realize that you're not going to be able to deliver, you protect your footprint. First thing you do, you try to make sure that where we are in this country, because a public broadcaster cannot be a public broadcaster without being deeply rooted in the regions. That's our first mandate, so we protect that. Then we have a series of things that we try to do. We protect news as much as we can. We take out dollars from our real estate, from our walls and our mortgages and the, the, the houses that we live in, and we try to retrench 
And we take those dollars and those savings and we plow them back into the content. We are extremely creative at trying to change the workflows and making sure that we remember that we have to keep informing, enlightening, and entertaining Canadians. Has it been always easy? The answer is no. And the people in this room can actually tell me this evening whether you think we've been doing that job up to your expectations. And to that point, just a question about your staff and how they're reacting. CBC's undergone a major shift in strategy, as you've outlined in your uh, speech. How did CBC overcome the resistance to change within, or some of that apprehension that you referred to? It's still going on. Um, we are much better at that. But remember, we have 80 years of history where people in our corporation identified themselves with the medium they were working for. Very powerful legacy assets, television, radio. This is what led the public broadcaster, and this is how you in this room reacted to us or engaged with us. Now, we take these two legacy assets and we say, yes, they're still important, but we want to shift your mindset to going mobile first, web second, radio third, and television fourth. That has been a spectacularly challenging shift. And when I say that we need to be able to see, and our employees need to be able to see proof points of this, and you know, three million Canadians more coming to our platforms in one year. Uh, the stories that uh, all of a sudden gather um, a number of, of clicks and a number of engagement from you. The comments that they receive as they're writing their stories. Our journalists are now seeing how much closer they are to their own audiences. And they don't have to go through a program to see this. They're actually interacting directly with you, whether it's on Facebook, whether it's Twitter, whatever medium you're using to have a conversation with them. When did you start using that language of transformation? When did you start messaging that the new strategy was that you were shifting? Has it been a number of years, just a couple of years? Like, it, obviously when people feel more comfortable with it, they'll perhaps get behind it a little bit more, right? I think, well, there are two pieces to this strategy. The 2015 strategy, which was from 2008, to 2015 because when I walked in literally with the team we sat and the first question was all right so where's the book where are we going uh, what was there before and because we're funding on 12 we're funded on 12 month basis every year we don't know whether we're going to get the same amount of dollars from government than the year before so our strategy was more an operation strategy where we went from 12 months Valerie to the next to well, the next 12 one of the things that we did is we started putting everybody under the same umbrella, having CBC and Radio Canada start speaking the same language in the context of what we call the 2015 strategy, which was around three things. People, programs, and pushing forward. People, the people that we have, the three Ps. Pushing forward the, the programs, so let's focus on trying to improve and focus on the quality of our programs. And then the third P was the pushing forward. The beginning of this strategy is the where we were going. Then, like everybody in this room, 2008 and 2009 happened. The financial impact on CBC Radio Canada of the meltdown in the markets affected us. And you'll see, why, La Croix, did it affect you? Well, our advertising revenue at that time was around 350 to 400 million bucks. We are funded by government appropriation to the tune of about, let's say, 60%, but 40% is advertising revenue and what we generate in our commercial revenues by leasing, by, by all sorts of commercial activities to, Im, to, to augment the number of dollars that we have. Well, what was the first thing that was affected in 2008, 2009? The auto manufacturers. And they were a significant advertiser on our, radio, on our television networks, so immediately, that went away, and we had a $200 million hit. That was the beginning of a conversation with ourselves saying, whoops, if this is going to happen, how are we going to change the public broadcaster by ourselves? And then the, 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 the deficit reduction uh, plan from, from the government, the changes in the way you guys, you, the people in the room consume, um, consume uh, media, this all started to, our, our senior team started talking about transformation as soon as we saw the business model faltering. 
And when we called it, we started saying the business model is broken, that's when the transformation came. Unfortunately, if I had to redo this again, I would try very hard to disconnect the financial situation from the plan itself. But they were so intertwined and so close together in time that when you announce the 2014 plan and you talk about the transformation, you're facing $135 million. And you're talking cuts. radical transformation. I mean, really, that's not a long time to no. be engaged in that kind of transformation. Uh, the Liberal government has uh, put back some of the funding. That you referred to $75 million, and the uh, previous government cut more than $100 million. Uh, where's that $75 going to go? What strategically are you going to do with that to achieve some of the goals that you're talking about? So three important buckets. The first bucket is this transformation that we're in. It needs to be supported and it needs to continue. So there's do there are dollars that are going to go there. Number two is as we, as we reshape the public broadcaster and we tried to balance our budget, there were some cuts in the regions. There were some cuts at the network level. There's a lot of repeats on our radio schedule. There's a lot of repeats on our programming te television schedule. We're going to try to address those issues. These are where, the, where Canadians are telling us a lot that um, we are failing on their expectations of a public broadcaster. So we're going to do that. And then the third one is about this transformation is leading us to think differently. And the web series or the content that we are creating just for the web or just for your, your widget in your hands is the third place where those dollars are going to go. Because when we started in the internet world, um, and it's pretty amazing that I've only been there eight years, but we were the first ones I, in, in our management team to actually put 5% of our budget, our revenues for, at that time, we called it Internet Things. Okay, 5% of our budget, because we saw this coming, but it's we didn't... a radical didn't, transformation, clearly. And, yeah, Internet and we didn't things. know actually where that was coming to come from, but we knew, we started seeing trends, and we needed to invest there. We're not too sure where, but we needed this, these dollars to be set aside. So, as this grew, um, we simply took a story that was from radio or from television, and we simply posted it online. Okay, it was, it, there, was no, there was no radical transformation to the story online. There was no writing skills for the story online, and there was surely no, because mobility didn't exist or just about at that time, nobody thought of changing the way the story should read when you see it on your phone. Now, if we did the same thing, you wouldn't spend a second on our website or on our own applications because it's five or six seconds, it has to be more compelling, the stories are built differently, and we have people that actually are focusing on web, on news uh, content, but really applied for the widgets, for whatever smartphone you have in your hands. And the same thing is going to happen for entertainment. It used to be that you had 30-minute programs and 60-minute programs. Not like that anymore. What we have is web-based stories, web-based series that you can actually watch that are 18 minutes, 22 minutes, 25 minutes. There's no such thing as a format that now limits the creator in the story that he or she wants to, wants to tell. So that's pretty exciting, actually very exciting, and that's where some of the stuff but also people out. are consuming on many different platforms throughout the day, different times, and so they're not engaging maybe for half an hour, an hour, right? It's Absolutely not. Little, bi little bites as well. Uh, just to follow up on the 75 million, do you have any indication that next year your budget will be lifted again as well? So it's 75 year one, and then for the four years that come, it's 150 million dollars for the in four each year? years to come in, in each year. year. So the total is 675 spread over five years, yeah. and uh, we're going to be very uh, proud to be accountable for those dollars and to tell you, frankly, exactly what we're going to be doing with these dollars as we are making these investments and making these shifts. Okay, we have another question from the public here. Uh, what, in your view, is the best way to promote the discoverability mm -hmm. of distinct Canadian content in a world of information abundance? Wow. <laughs> Whoever asked that question, we'd like you to show up in Johnny's team tomorrow mm -hmm. and to have a conversation with us because this is like... 11 people asked that question. Well, 11 people are showing up for coffee tomorrow, Pierre and Johnny. <laughs> what, I'm, what I'm trying to say is this is a very big challenge. So how do we go at it? Yes, we can promote 
what we do. But what we're trying to say is that when you think CBC, when you think Radio Canada, the, the, the reflexes have to be Canadian content, distinctive Canadian stories, Canadian music, Canadian entertainers, Canadian producers. A place where, and when I, when I use the expression of Canadian public place, we really believe in that. That is what we're trying to shape. And we would like you to think, when you think about discoverability, that when you, when you want something which is about our country, that you go there first, because you know you're going to get it. Yeah, I, I, I have to say something about t today. Today we lost a very important war loss. We haven't lost him yet. But there's a very, very sad story about a tragically hip singer, Gord Downey, who is an incredible, an incredible songwriter that wrote about Canada, wrote about hockey, wrote about our land, our values, this guy right now is really sick. These are the kinds of Canadian artists that CBC Radio Canada need to promote. They're different, they're extraordinary, and we have as much talent as anybody else in the world. So when I saw this story this morning, I was extremely sad, because when you heard a tragically hip song in the first five bars, you knew it was tragically hip because of the sound of his voice. So this is where the story, the songwriter, the Canadian band, the values. You know, I thought of us, literally, when I heard the story about Gord Downey today. And it's been topping the news in all of the newsrooms across the country, and it's going viral everywhere. I'm and sure. Maybe not hearing it on the American or other stations or websites. Uh, here's a question that my industry could be asked as well. How do you create new revenue sources in light of decreasing traditional ad revenues? This wow. is a problem we're all facing. Yes. Share with me your ideas. And <laughs> only if you share back. <laughs> we can go out later and chat. <laughs> um, Link. You know, we look, there's a, there's a business concept called a long tail. The long tail means that it's not about one extraordinary new source of revenue. We've been looking for it. If you can find it, you can, you can email me. Um, that's not going to be the case. What we're trying to do is we're trying to find all sorts of different places in our activities that meet the mandate of the public broadcaster, because that's a challenge, that are not going to change the question of a, f a few minutes ago, that are not going to change what we do as a public broadcaster or denature. Um, who we are. So, yes, it's going to be about uh, some commercial activities. It's going to be about product placement. It's going to be about the advertising environment in which we are more linked to the programs that we run. It's going to be about commercial revenues. It's going to be about renting our premises instead of owning our premises. Every single way for us to add a million bucks to our bottom line, or to our top line, actually, $500,000. I mean, we're looking at these kinds of ways to increase our revenues because we know that every dollar that we gain is a dollar that we can pour into content. Mm -hmm. Content. Well, there's a very lengthy question here about content, and it's actually a good question for all media today, but it talks about uh, the, the rush to connect with, uh, with readers and audience and reporters having to push out news stories digitally as quickly as possible, like rush to be first and rush to get it up there. So one of our uh, audience here notices that there's a decrease, he or she thinks, in journalistic integrity, that reporters are actually not doing their research as thoroughly as they did before. It seems like the goal is no longer bringing real or truthful stories to readers, but rather being the first to break the news. So what do we do about that, and how do we balance that, and do you agree with that even? I would like to think understanding the pressures of being the first ones on a story, that our um, news, that our, that our JSPs, our journalistic standards and policies, still are smartly managed by everybody who runs a newsroom in this country for CBC Radio Canada. And that we talk, when we talk about two sources, when we talk about all of the things that make our brand trustworthy, because when we poll Canadians, one of the first things that you guys say about us is that you trust the news when you come to our, uh, to our website in the same way I'm sure that they trust when, you, when they see a story posted on the Sun of the Province, they understand that you have done your work and that nobody just posts something up and then retracts it later on. 
we still think that this is one of our major strengths. That when you come to us, we've checked, we have the necessary back, the facts to put that story up. Now, does that take away some of the pressures on our, on our people in the newsroom? No. Um, does that mean that they have to work harder in this environment where the, the last tweet might send them in, in, a, in a particular direction and you have to hold them back and you say, no, did you triple check or double check? Do you have another source? Yes, that is putting pressure on us. But we are never going to uh, dilute the, uh, the trust factor for speed. I would add, too, I don't think it's an all or nothing. Uh, you definitely have those reporters who are committed to the fast-breaking news, and they may be on shift all day long, just posting as quickly as they possibly can. But that doesn't mean that you don't have your people assigned to all day or days, or maybe even weeks, doing those deeper contextual pieces, doing those series, doing the, the, the deep think as the well. investigative journalism. The investigative journalists, exactly. So it isn't all or nothing, it's a blending really, and it's how you manage your newsroom, where you put your resources, and how many people are doing that at any given time. Time. And there's some people in this room that I'm what, looking at in the first room, in the first row, like, like Wayne, who have been doing this for a number of years and who know much more about handling a newsroom than I do. And there's a lot of senior reporters who've been on the job 20, 30 years or more, and uh, they are working harder, longer, faster than before. They're, they're tweeting and they're on Snapchat. Some of your, your data was amazing at the the number of users there are today of all, on all of these different platforms with these applications and uh, reporters are tweeting and they're blogging and they're writing and it's just phenomenal to see them uh, and it, it takes in many cases a great deal of experience to be able to juggle all that. Huh? And to do it live. There's some, some, some hosts that are right now as they are doing their morning shows. They are watching the Twitter feed. They are responding to, um, by email sometimes, to people who are still using email. I mean, email now is the regular mail. Twitter is your actual feed. So the speed at which they are actually doing this as they are hosting their program, doing the interviews, is pretty spectacular. So that's another transformation in the way that we actually work. Uh, you now expect to reach Rick Clough in the morning. You expect to speak to Marie. I mean, all of those voices and all of those faces that you connect to CBC and to CBC Vancouver, you expect to have a relationship with them. Now, if you expect that relationship, it means there has to be somebody at the other end of the relationship that is going to be responding and engaging with you. And we need those, the, the, this transformation to allow and the tools and the skills and the resources to be able to allow the Ricks of the world to engage with you. Uh, and whether it's the television news in the evening or whether it's, um, it's a radio program. We have a question uh, that's very relevant in Vancouver where there's quite a cultural diversity among our population. So the multicultural and social makeup of Canada is changing. Our need to reach our newcomers so that they can be better adapted into our society and communities has never been more critical. So what is CBC's strategy in responding to this change and this need? We understand that well. Um, there are a number of cities in this country uh, that have benefited and there are much better cities because of this influx of people from around the world. We understand at CBC, Azo Canada, that if we don't reflect the communities in which we work with voices, again, with people who are hosting our programs, that actually understand the people that they are speaking to and that they are involved with, that we are going to be failing as a public broadcaster. Do we do this all the time correctly? No. Do we have to continue improving on diversity? Absolutely. Um, the gender piece, I think we've been working on very much. 49 or 50 percent of our staff is female, male, depending now, because you, you're actually pretty equal. In our environment, my senior executive team, I have uh, six women, two men reporting to me. They're the most senior positions. What we need to continue doing, though, is the diversity factor has to be reflected in the skills that we hire in the corporation and the different jobs that we have. And when we hire each, when we, when we add one person to our environment, we'd like to think, okay, will this diversity um, challenge 
be helped by this hire. That is something we try to do very often. We have indicators, we follow, um, we understand the challenge. And your downsizing aside, uh, how much of a turnover is there at CBC? Do you have people who stay in their jobs a very long time yes. so that you're not able to bring in that new blood? I mean, I think no, no, a lot that, of the Valerie. media... Have and we have collective problem. agreements. Remember that 87% of our employees are unionized. That simply means that 87% of the positions are um, protecting seniority. So when you have a job cut, we cut the job, we don't cut the person. So when we eliminate a person, this person bumps, 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 and obviously the person who is the last hire or the youngest hire normally will be suffering from these cuts. This is one of the greatest strategy, greatest tragedy of the 3,500 cuts that we made. We lost a lot of younger people so that now you look at our organization and it's like a looking glass. It was, let's say, more like this, but with the cuts, it really looks like a like a um, well, and the, glass. the remuneration is very good. The benefit package is very good. So there's an incentive to stay as well. Where many many years ago, people would want a little bit of you know travel or they'd want some change. Now, because the landscape, there's it's very difficult to get those those good media jobs. People stay for a very long time, and then you don't get your turn. I remember a conversation with a with a guy, a young man you might know because. He is a high profile, a guy by the name of Wab Kanu. Wab Kanu was a reporter in our Winnipeg plant. Um, I remember my first meeting with Wab Kanu. He was 27, 28. He then went to CTV and he's now working for University of Winnipeg. Uh, and we were talking about some of the issues with respect to um, our pension plan. <laughs> he looked at me and he laughed. He said, Lacroix, I'm going to work very, very hard for CBC Radio Canada for five years, but if you think I'm coming to CBC Radio Canada for the pension plan, you're, you're completely out to lunch. That is what we now see. We are a university. We're a place where people come, they'll do five or six years, and then they move on to something else. They'll come back later, perhaps. But these, these places, the, the, our institution used to, you would walk in, and it's not a job that you would find at CBC Radio Canada. It was a career and you would move across the country in different places. Now, the mindset of the young people or the younger people that we hire is not that one at all. They'll go hard in one direction, they'll find something, then they'll go somewhere else. Our major issue is trying to retain them in our corporation mm -hmm. because their, their focus is, is not a career. I've seen numbers saying that new graduates today will have 26 different jobs in the course of their career. So, you know, to your point, it's true. I haven't seen any hands go up. Are, are there any questions from the floor? Uh, the mic could. Terrific. Thank you. I'd like you to um, speak a little bit about the the two universes of Radio Canada and CBC. They're so separate. And I think that there's a lot of potential to share what each of them has. If there could only be a way of um, dubbing a bit more, using more subtitles, using other more creative mm. forms. Because when I lived in Quebec, I was surprised at the um, tremendous sense of humor that was lost on English Canada. They didn't even know about it. And I think it would be a great way to somehow connect on differing points of view. Thank you for that question. That'll save you some money. CBC Radio Canada addresses two completely different audiences. But those audiences, it doesn't mean that something that is very good in French actually works in English or very good in, in English works in French. However, the quality of the creators and what we actually do to create that content is something that we're starting more and more and it was accelerated because of these cuts. Now, you've got the teams working as close as they've ever were, I mean, worked. You've got people crossing uh, the different provinces. We have units that take people in different provinces trying to bring them together. You have newsrooms right now where you have one assignment editor for French and English. So that's one part that has actually improved through uh, these tough times that we've gone through. We've tried, actually, I shouldn't say, yes, we have tried. 
English Canada tried to import some of the very uh, popular programs from French. This is Life is the last one that uh, I think um, uh, CBC did about this story uh, about a young woman who had cancer and was dying. It was on our, on our network in English. It's actually a French series that worked really, really well in English. It's going to get season two in English, as Sally Cato announced. But for whatever reason, the content, the drama content, the variety content, the sense of humor of English Canada and of French Canada is different. That's why we try to cater to these audiences in different ways. But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't be doing more in terms of bringing these people together so that they can actually learn from their lessons and give you a better content, or give you better content and a better product. Servicing culture. There was a gentleman at the back on the other side of the house who had his uh, hand up. Over there, I think. No. Oh. I, have one, I have one here. Okay. okay, thank you. Thank you for sharing your knowledge. My question is about the censorship and the influence of foreign governments on your content, like if you are covering the war, whether it's in Israel or United States or even the role of the army, is there any control you get or any type of censorship? Zero censorship. Zero. And if there's one thing that all governments in the history of the, of the, of the public broadcaster have respected, and that's true for any government that goes back, the, the difference, the independence of the public broadcaster has always been extremely well understood and protected. Uh, if not, the presidents would go as soon as the, uh, the governments change, the, the news would be influenced, you would get a call from a minister unhappy with our coverage of a budget speech or of an intervention somewhere in the world. That's, that's something that um, uh, everybody in Ottawa understands very well. The, the close sister of uh, censorship is access, though. Do you find that your reporters get access to the places they need to and want to get access to? We, well, I think the people who are in this row might be better uh, at answering that question. I'm not uh, at all shy at asking. Wayne, what do you think? But abroad as well. I mean, if if yeah. you are not, if your journalists are not permitted to travel into a certain area of a city or a country, then that's going to affect uh, your coverage. Sure, absolutely. You know, the same, we'd be under the same restrictions as else. As other media, sure, of course. So the answer for those who are in the back, if you didn't hear, is that same rules for everybody. We don't feel that we are um, differently treated or targeted. And there's, there's, I've always, in, in the last couple of years, there's some different outfits in the world that have started becoming or calling themselves news services. Some of them... News um, services? Well, news services or news organizations. Mm -hmm. Vice, for example, is an interesting um, phenomenon. Um, you have to respect what they've built. They've built an incredible brand. Now, you have to decide whether this is news, whether this is entertainment, whether this is a combination of both, and you have to decide whether you are going to believe that the, um, and it's not, knock, it's not a knock on vice, but you have to believe that an organization like ours, or organizations like ours, and the journalistic principles that come with our, with our content, whether the same principles are applied el el elsewhere. And this is why I think there's a distinction to be made between those organizations and um, what content they produce and the content of the, of the Sun, the province, or... And originality, or right? And we call it rip and read, where another outlet just rips it off the wire or rips it off your website, reads it. You don't know that it's from CBC or the Vancouver Sun or wherever it might be from. It sounds as though it's original, but it's Absolutely. not, right? So that's something else we're up against. And that leads into a question about profit, really. How does CBC plan to make profits from its digital platform to the fullest? Because a lot of newsrooms have resorted to paywalls. I mean... So there's no, monetize? you probably know that, um, well, I told you a few minutes ago that we are funded in two ways. Our revenue line 
depends on a government appropriation to about 60% and 40% is our ad revenues and our commercial activities by ourselves. Um, the, this model is still the one, this hybrid model of funding is still the one that, you, um, that, that Canada uses to fund its public broadcaster. $28 is now, well, sorry, $31 because of this increase by the Liberal government, $31 of your taxes, $31 of your taxes per year go to financing the public broadcaster, okay? If you're a Netflix person, how many people in this room have Netflix? Okay, you still can't believe this. You have, <laughs> you pay $8 a month times 12, so that's 96 bucks to Netflix a year. Do you have Netflix? No, I don't. <laughs> but, but, I understand what Netflix does, okay? It's on, I, I've not subscribed, it's on my television set if I want it, but I'm not a Netflix person. What I'm trying to say is that when you look at how we're funded, you already give us 28 bucks a year. So there's no question that there's not gonna be a paywall on the normal things we do. But in Radio-Canada, we have something called 2TV, which is an experiment of ours. 2TV is our catch-up sort of eye player, where you will find not only Radio-Canada stuff, but you'll, you'll find stuff from all the other public broadcasters in the world that speak French, or you'll get something from Belgium, from France, from Africa, and it's free. But if you want to access what we call the extra piece, which is ahead of everything, which might be original series to be on the general network in the year, in the year after, you have to pay six or seven bucks. We're trying to see whether there's an interest for this kind of exclusive content that doesn't take away from everything else you are getting for the $31 you give us every year. But we are attempting to see whether there is an interest for these kinds of services to try to monetize, monetize. the digital yeah. environment. Yeah. I think we have to wind up. I'll take one more question from the floor if we have someone. Good. I've got a mic here. Does that help? Yes. Um, you mentioned the 87% of people who produce and create and perform in the, the content that uh, the CBC and Radio Canada produce. And last fall, the two unions expressed a vote of lack of confidence in you oh, yeah. and the board. And I'm hoping that was a tempest in the teapot and that you've resolved that. But I just wonder if you, in the term that you have left in your second term, the year and a half or so, if you care to address what you and the executive team, the board and the unions can do to heal that dissidence. Let me tell you about the union relationship because I think this is a really good story. Um, when I came in, we were, CBC was walking out of a lockout, a really nasty lockout. It um, had to be, there had to be a government intervention to bring both parties together. And the two guys, uh, because they were men, who negotiated for CBC and Azu Canada, uh, for CBC, for CBC, and for the union, the CMG, the Canada Media Guild, they didn't even look at each other, they didn't even shake their hand, I mean, they just, it was a mess. So you walk into this, you see how difficult this is, and we reinvented completely the relationship with the guild, to the point where this reinvention of the relationship is now a business case taught at Queen's University at the master's, in, uh, industrial relations master degree level. Because we completely re-engineered it. We spent weeks in a little Holiday Inn type hotel in Port Credit. We brought everybody in the room. We opened uh, all the issues. We talked about what had gone wrong. And we said that status quo was not an option. We reinvented that relationship. Now you're quite right, sir. That relationship really got tested a couple of years ago, when, in the middle of all these cuts, the, uh, the union said, La Croix, you're not doing enough, you're not fighting back the cuts, you're not doing this, you're not doing that, because in a public way, some of them would have wanted me to be extremely aggressive against some of the cuts that were coming. I chose not to use the newspapers to negotiate with the government and to continue working with our board at trying to deliver content for Canadians. Because 
in the previous environment, I didn't think that for CBC Radio-Canada, fighting with the government on the first page of the paper was going to do much good to us. Now, that got calls for my resignation, caught for good, nasty things. You didn't want my job at that time, I promise you. Uh, it wasn't much fun. That, obviously now, in this kind of environment, with seven months that gives you the reinvestment that you just read or that I just talked about, with um, um, the test of how this reinvestment is going to be done, the care we think they're seeing in what the board and us are doing in trying to deliver uh, this reinvestment to Canadians, that has shifted. And obviously, we're back to a much more normal relationship. That's the CBC side. On the Radio Canada side, for the first time in our history, 80 years of it, I don't know when the three or the four unions um, got to unionize some of our employees, but those four unions have been there for a long time. And we fought for, four, for close to three years in front of the Labour Board to try to get these four unions into one union because we wanted to make sure like in CBC, that when you speak to the Guild and you talk about the jobs morphing, you talk about flexibility, you talk about the different platforms on which they work, we're more interested in the person's ability to have all sorts of skills than a particular job in appointed uh, work, because when that changes, you lose your job. But when you have different skills, you can actually be um, useful somewhere else in the company and you don't lose your job. The guilds got that. They understand that. Now, is it a perfect world? No. But we're trying to do this in Azul Canada as we speak. So we've just started two weeks ago the most important negotiation in the history of Azul Canada where we're trying to take these four collective agreements because we won our case in front of the Labour Board. They said it's crazy to have four unions. We had so many grievances with respect to you can do this, but you have to come if you want to put the flowers on the floor. You know, all these, these crazy things about what unions should not be about, which is a particular job. Now what we're trying to do is get that into one agreement. It's starting now. It's going to be a challenging time. We hope that the same spirit that we got on the Guild side is going to allow us to put these, un these, these four collective agreements in one great collective agreement for our, our Radio Canada side for the years to come. But it's a transformative moment. We've been talking about change and transformation. What Valerie, we're going to do in Radio Canada over the next couple of, well, the next few months, because this is not going to be a short-term short thing, is going to be the biggest challenge of our industrial relations career on the Radio Canada side. I think it's worth noting too that the discussions that we're having here around trans transformation, radical transformation, that discussion is happening within all of our uh, unions as well. And they, they're very much partners in terms of meeting this head on because you don't do it exclusive of your people. And uh, you know everyone is interested and committed to the survival of our industry and its continued relevance and success. Right? And I think the leadership of the Guild also is there. They understand that the shift that we've embarked upon, it's not coming back. That what the choices we made a few years ago as we were scaling down the broadcaster, that's not coming back. 90 minutes of news in the evening is not coming back because you guys don't watch 90 minutes of news in the evening. So why should we be investing resources for 90 minutes of news? I would rather, and I think the Guild gets this, uh, and this is why the conversations have, have really morphed into, okay, how can we now make this environment about wellness, about a better environment, about workload, about ensuring that this transformation that we're all living is something that doesn't take the health and the, in the, the, um, the, um, yeah, the physical well-being of our employees with those changes. And that's, that's a big conversation right now at, at CBC Radio Canada. And with that, I think we're out of our 90 minutes this evening. So I'll have to thank you very much. Thank you. That's been wonderful. Thank you, Valerie. Thank you so thank much. You much. And thank you all thank for you. coming.
I, I still can't believe that picture. <laughs> it's kind of like the President of the United States, yeah, you know, know, before and after the term. Wow. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in giving Valerie Castleton and Hubert Lacroix one more round of applause. Thank you very much, Valerie. Thank you. As mentioned, tonight's event has been podcasted and videotaped. So to download as well as access podcasts and photos from tonight's event or past events, I encourage everyone to visit the Alumni UBC website, where you will find an extensive library of thought-provoking topics. More than 25,000 of you have done so this past year. You will also be able to access the webcast on the Irving K. Barber uh, Learning Center Digital Library. And we, of course, want to acknowledge and thank them for their participation tonight. Please join us for the next Mastermind Masterclass, which will take place in November, featuring American music composer John Corgliano. More information will be coming soon. Other activities to note very quickly, as mentioned earlier, our centennial close celebrations will take place on May 28th. UBC 100 What's Next will feature our four future talks speakers, Rick Hansen, Elizabeth Croft, Miru Dalawala, and Sapora Berman. And of course, we'll culminate with a keynote from William Shatner. On June 14th, uh, we invite everyone to participate and join us for Should I Stay or Should I Go? Uh, join us as we bring together UBC alumni who will share their very personal journeys as well as UBC experts who will offer strategies for anyone who, want to find, who wants to find a way to stay in our beautiful city. This informative talk will take place at the Fairmont Pacific Rim. And on June 15th, please join us for another provocative discussion, Sexual Assault on Trial, Gomeshi Survivors, Media and the Law. Join us as we hear an esteemed panel as they examine what we have learned from the public discourse around the Gomeshi trials and start a conversation about how we can better serve survivors of sexual assault. Uh, this discussion will be moderated by Margot Young of the Aller School of Law, and the panelists will include legal experts in sexual assault trials and experts on the impact this has on survivors. That will take place at the Robert H. Lee Alumni Center. Thank you so much for your participation. We had well over 50 questions, and we endeavored to get to as many as possible. Thank you, Valerie. And uh, we invite all of you uh, to join us for the conversations that will take place outside this theater. And Hubert has uh, kindly agreed to stay to address as many of those questions as possible. Thank you. And now I invite all of you to continue the conversation outside. Thank you. Thank you.